Hello, welcome to the comic book commentary. My name is Bo Leidig, and today we're going to be taking a look at Spawn number one, a comic that I've been enjoying for a good many years, and one that I hope that we can shed a little bit of light on as to where it started. Let's zoom in and take a closer look. First published in May of 1992, creator Todd McFarlane, story pencils and inks also by Todd McFarlane, letters by Tom Orzakowski, color Steve Olaf, and editor Wanda Kolmajek. Tom and Wanda, I'm quite certain I mispronounced both of your last names, and I do apologize for doing that. As you can see here on the right-hand side, we have a glimpse of the Earth from outer space. This is, I believe, to infer that Spawn is not starting out on the earthly plane. As we can see in the bottom, it shows a skyline view of New York City, which is where Spawn is mostly based out of throughout the early years of this comic. So here on page number two, we get a glimpse of the first time of seeing that Spawn's dealing with real memory loss issues. Uh, he doesn't really understand why he came back from the world of the dead or much of what his previous life was. Uh, we can also see here on page number three that there are many news reports speaking of the death of Al Simmons. Al Simmons, of course, being who Spawn was in the world of the living. Uh, it's interesting to point out here that these reports are taking place in 1987. This is important because uh, Spawn is actually taking place somewhat in real time starting in 1992. So there's actually a five-year gap between when Al Simmons dies and when he comes back as Spawn. Uh, this plays a major role in the plots going forward for this comic as much of what Spawn came back for has changed drastically in that five years, as we're going to see going forward. So here on page number four, we can see how jumbled Spawn's memory is. He has memories of someone that he loved, but he can't remember who it was. He has memories of people who betrayed him in his previous life, but he doesn't remember exactly who they are. He knows that he was involved in the U.S. military, but not necessarily to what capacity, and that he was murdered by people that he trusted. Um, these are all things that get hashed out in later issues, but at this point, he's very confused as to exactly why he came back and who he came back for and for what purpose he made this decision. Uh, also here on page number five, we can see that there's an advertisement to buy uh, Amazing Spider-Man and Spider-Man and autographed Spider-Man comics all drawn by Todd McFarlane. Many of you may realize that Todd at one point worked for Marvel and was the primary artist for Spider-Man during that time period. Uh, it's also interesting to note down here on the bottom that the shipping costs actually go up when you spend more money, which is a very strange business model in today's world to see. But apparently in 1992, that's just how they were doing things. We see here on page number six that Spawn does remember making his deal with the devil and that it was so he could come back for the love of a woman who he at this point sadly cannot remember the name of or what his relationship to her was in the world of, live, of the living. It's really making Spawn into a very sympathetic character at this point because he was so bent on coming back for this person and now has no idea how to even get in contact with her. Uh, we also see here on page number seven that he's well aware that he was definitely had by the devil in making this deal. He made a deal that was skewed completely against him that he was taken advantage of in a huge way. Um, we also get a glimpse here in the bottom right-hand corner of a power gauge. Uh, Spawn's powers are not unlimited. As we will find out going forward, he is immensely powerful, but... 
there is a very finite limit to how much of that power he can use. And the more he uses, the faster he burns through it, which becomes a very interesting plot device going forward. So here on page number eight, we see a much more prominently displayed view of Spawn's power gauge at the top. We also see Spawn very much realizing that he has no idea why he's here, who he was, and he comes to the conclusion that the only way he can answer these questions is by finding the woman in his visions, despite the fact that he has no, no idea who she is or where he should be looking for her. Uh, here on page number nine, we just see a public service announcement to go check out your local comic book store, which is never a bad idea. I recommend it to anyone who's watching this. Go check out your local comic book store. Support them. Uh, find something that interests you. There's a world of comics out there to be discovered, and it's all at your fingertips. Here on pages 10 and 11, we get a fantastic full spread image of Spawn standing on top of the buildings in New York, uh, obviously, this image is supposed to be viewed vertically. However, my studio setup doesn't really allow me to have a great way to film that. I do apologize. Uh, we also see Spawn really just dedicate himself to the resolve of finding the woman in his visions and then later finding the people who betrayed him to enact some form of vengeance. Here on page number 12, we get our first introduction to Sam and Twitch, who are two detectives that work for New York City's police department, uh, currently investigating the latest in a string of murders involving New York City's organized crime families. Uh, we also are led to believe that Twitch is more of a by-the-numbers type of guy, whereas Sam is much more the emotional... Uh, loose cannon type of detective. Um, Sam, not too upset about these criminals being murdered. Uh, in fact, he seems like he's a little bit okay with that. Uh, the latest one that they're investigating here involves a man being thrown out of the 44th story of a building in New York. And, you know, neither one of them seem to be too upset by this, which is a little disturbing given the subject matter. Here on page 14, we see that Spawn, while moving through the city skyline, uh, happens to overhear a gang of ne'er-do-wells, if you will, uh, assaulting a young woman, and he, of course, doesn't take kindly to this at all, and quickly interjects himself into the situation. I'd like to point out that this is the first instance that we see of Spawn speaking aloud directly to other people, and that there is a thick gray border around his speech bubbles. It's never really explained why this is, if it's just to bring attention to Spawn whenever he speaks, or if it is to infer that Spawn's voice is ethereal in some way, or more booming than a normal voice of a normal person. Uh, it's also uh, interesting to point out here that these street toughs have the belief that Spawn is part of Youngblood. Youngblood is a superhero team that existed in the early days of Image that was created by one Mr. Rob Liefeld, who, as most of you would probably know, also was the creator of Deadpool. So here on page 16, we can see that one of the street gang members decides that they're going to face off against Spawn, uh, which is kind of odd considering the fact that uh, despite them not realizing that Spawn was some sort of reincarnated hell hero with all sorts of otherworldly powers, they do believe that he is part of Youngblood, who is a world-renowned superhero team, so they still think that he's some kind of super being, and that he could have any number of weird superpowers that they're not ready for, and this guy just uh, decides that he's going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Spawn with nothing but what looks to be a kitchen knife. Good luck with that, buddy. Uh, and next to it, right here, which, by the way, is not page 17, uh, you might be thinking it is, but you're going to find out in just a moment why it's not, we see an advertisement for 
the comic book greats, which is a video series that was released. They were home video that you had to order, um, involving interviews with different comic book creators, different people in the industry. Stan Lee was involved with it. I've never seen any of these and I kind of wish I had, I I'd love to be able to track these down somehow. I'll have to do some digging online to see if I can find uh, copies of these or somewhere that they're posted. Cause I'm actually really interested in, you know, hearing what a lot of these people had to say about what they were dealing with at this time, where the industry was headed at this time. It'd be a really unique moment in history to go back and get a little bit of a retrospective on, especially from the people who were highly involved in the industry at that time. So as I stated, that was not actually page 17 with that advertisement. It was the backside of this awesome pullout poster that was in the middle of this comic book. Uh, this was something that was done pretty frequently at that time period to include cool little removable posters that you could get um, in comic books and magazines alike. Um, very often video game magazines such as Nintendo Power would have really awesome fold-out posters that you could take out, put on your wall. Uh, it's not something that you see as frequently anymore. Uh, I kind of wish it would come back. This was a really cool little Easter egg to find when you picked up a comic book and know that you could take a poster out and be like, hey, check out this awesome Spawn poster I got. You can get one too if you go buy the book. Kind of a little of incentive there to get your friends to go out and buy cool comic books as well. Uh, I, I really do think this was such an awesome idea and I'd love to see this come back in full force going forward. So here on the other reverse side of that poster, we see an ad for the 1992 Chicago Comic Con, which featured many of the founding members of Image Comics. This was a really all-star lineup of uh, guys who were instrumental in the early success of Image. Uh, it would have been super cool to attend and have a chance to get these guys to sign comics uh, meet all of them. I, I really am jealous of anyone who was able to attend that. Uh, over here on page 17, despite the fact that all of these other guys have just witnessed Spawn throw their leader through a glass window after he came at him with a knife, they decide they're going to try and step to Spawn as well. Uh, also, I find it's worth pointing out here that uh, this guy's speech is somewhat censored. You notice he says, you crazy MF, instead of actually just swearing. Uh, it's kind of weird to see something like that in these early days of Image as uh, in the current lineup, Todd doesn't really censor any of the things that are said. Uh, I don't know if it was at the time he felt like he wanted Spawn to be more of a PG-13 type of comic, more so than an R-rated, if you will. Uh, but it was it's it was weird to see that going back and reading this again for the first time in, I don't know, 15 years. Uh, also, we see that none of these guys had what it took to face off with Spawn as he just hits them all with a giant blast of Necro Energy and wipes them out pretty quickly. So, you know, Street Tough's not much of a threat to this guy. Here on page number 18, we can see an advertisement for the upcoming Spawn trading card series. Uh, there's no game involved to it or anything like that. They're just trading cards. However, they were cut to a very odd size as compared to normal trading cards of the time and... That was kind of annoying because they don't fit into trading card sleeves. Um, they also weren't as high of an art quality as what you saw in the comic books. Um, I'll give Todd credit for trying to think outside of the box when he created those, of trying to do something different, trying to set himself apart. But in execution, it didn't really work out as well as maybe he wanted it to. Um... I have some of these cards. It's a neat oddity, but they don't really they don't really stand up to like say the Marvel trading cards of that time or maybe some of the other trading card series that DC was putting out. Like I mean they were they were cool, just not quite as cool. 
Um, here on page number 19, we can see the uh, woman who was just accosted by the street punks is very much fearful of Spawn, which probably should have been the same reaction that those street punks should have had. Uh, Spawn's a pretty intimidating fellow. You know, even if you didn't know what his powers were, which they didn't when he first appeared, it is some big jacked guy covered in chains and a giant cape, and you thought he was a superhero, so maybe don't just try to fight him before you, uh, you know, realize what he can do. Uh, we also get the first instance of Spawn having a flashback uh, slash hallucinating about possibly his death, his time in hell. Um, he's very shaken by it. Uh, we also get this glimpse right here on the bottom panel of an outline of Spawn's mouth underneath the mask. This is not something that is done frequently throughout this comic. Uh, it's very rare that we ever get that much of a facial outline of Spawn underneath the mask. It was really cool to see that when I reread this book. Uh, I really was not expecting to see Todd go into that kind of detail, and it's not something that you see frequently, so it was, it was cool to look at that again. On page 20, we get a glimpse of Spawn's hallucination slash flashback, where, again, he's completely consumed by images of the woman he can't remember. Um, also, seeing glimpses of his own funeral, which can't possibly be good for his mental state. That's got to be horrible. Um, on the top of page 21, more images of the woman whose face then changes into a demon face. Um, then he snaps out of it, and I thought this was a cool thing to include here in this bottom panel, where Spawn showed up to save this woman from being assaulted, and now she's the one who's having to comfort him. That was a cool little, like, way for Todd to show that, you know, Spawn's not this invulnerable super being. Like, he's, he's a sympathetic character, and he's really struggling dealing with the fact that Though he has all these crazy powers, he's not prepared to have these powers. Um, he, he was really thrown into something that he doesn't understand and that he didn't ask for. And I, I really like what Todd did with this. It's, it's, it's a simple way to do it, and he did it really well. So here on page 22, we see that... It is very much being shown to everybody that it is 1992. It has been five years since Spawn died as Al Simmons. Um, we also see multiple news reports speaking about the murders that Sam and Twitch are investigating. Also a report about the sightings of Spawn in New York City. We also see that Todd made the creative choice to use the trademarked logos of both CNN and the E! Network which he did not really have the legal authority to do, and he would be informed of that in the future by the legal teams of both of those networks. Uh, moving on to page 23, uh, we see Spawn finally realize that the woman that he's been having these visions of is actually his wife, and now he's really determined to find her. Um, he really wants to figure out who he was, what happened. Uh, he's really concerned about getting back to her. And he's like, I've got to get this costume off of my face so she can see who I am. I've got to let her know that I'm still alive. And unfortunately, that's not going to work out as well as he thought. On page 24, we can see that Spawn is unfortunately not in the same physical condition that he was when he last saw himself. He is very much scarred and marred as a human being. He is in rough shape and does not even remotely resemble who he was as Al Simmons, which is going to be a real problem for him going forward and trying to prove to the world that he's back. Uh, also here on page 25, uh, interestingly enough, we see an advertisement for Rust, um, Rust was not a terribly successful comic. However, it should be pointed out 
that Rust Special Edition number one is considered by most to be the first appearance of Spawn. It's odd. He doesn't really appear as part of the comic. It's an advertisement for Spawn that features prototype artwork of the cover of Spawn number two on the reverse inside cover at the very end of the book. So some people kind of don't really consider it necessarily to be a first appearance because he's not part of the book. It's just an advertisement, which may be why Rust Special Edition number one, even as a 9.8, is not terribly expensive to buy. Generally, you can find it in the neighborhood of between $100 and $200, or at least you can as at the time that I'm recording this video. Um, I don't have a copy. I've never felt the need to get a copy. It just seems like it's not really part of the Spawn story, despite having that ad in the back. But some people feel differently, and that's okay. Buy whatever you want. It's your money. It's cool. Um, but it's just a little interesting tidbit of Spawn history, and I thought it was cool that this advertisement was included in the first issue of Spawn, as Spawn's first advertisement was included in the first issue of Rust. Uh, here on page 26, we get an image of Spawn falling back into the garbage, feeling defeated, giving into his depression, realizing that whoever he was before, he is no longer that person now, and that if he does manage to find his wife, she in all likelihood is not going to recognize him today as the man she once knew. And this is really overwhelming for him. Uh, again, it's a, an instance of Spawn being given a humanity and a vulnerability uh, despite being so powerful. Um, at the bottom of the page, we get a discussion between Sam and Twitch as they're starting to get reports and sightings of Spawn, and they don't know who he is, um, which is funny because he doesn't know who he is either, uh, but they're kind of wondering what his endgame is, um, what his business in the city is, and they're not sure if they can trust him yet. Uh, we also get a cool little line at the bottom that feels a little bit throwaway, but it's not, um, where Sam states, wonder how much power this guy has in him, and just underneath it, we notice that the power gauge has gone down by five. This was a cool way of explaining to the readers that Spawn's power is finite. And, you know, he's not going to be able to just go around doing whatever he wants, you know, firing blasts of necroplasm and just burning through it without any consequences. Um, we also see here on page 27, the very first appearance of the Mabulja, um, Mabulja, of course, is the ruler of the Eighth Circle of Hell, and despite being the one who sent Spawn back to the world of the living, he's got nefarious plans for Spawn in the future. And at the very bottom of the page, we see that the next issue will be the very first appearance of the Violator. Here on pages 28 and 29, which are no longer part of the story of this book, we just get two cool full-page panel artworks. Um, on the left, we have Pitt, drawn by Dale Keown, another founding member of Image Comics. Fantastic artwork. Love seeing it. On the right, we see a full-page picture of Spawn by George Perez. This is awesome. Uh, again, not something they needed to include, but I'm not complaining. I love seeing this kind of stuff. I would love to see this more frequently in comics today. It's just kind of like that weird snapshot of history of things that were going on and you know it's it's something that while great at the time kind of went away and I'd love to see it come back this is a really cool way to advertise other people's work in your book here on page 30 we get our first look at the spawning ground which in the future would be where Todd would answer letters from fans uh, give updates about what was happening with the comic what would be happening with his toy line, which at this point doesn't exist yet. Um, but it was just a way for him to keep in contact with his reader base. Uh, this issue, however, it's just a single letter that Todd writes, kind of explaining what their thought process was in creating Image Comics, him and the other co-founders, um, explaining how they felt 
disenfranchised, taken advantage of, in some cases even exploited. Uh, perfect example, uh, some of you may not realize, Todd McFarlane co-created Venom with David Michelini. Uh, David, if I mispronounce your last name, I sincerely apologize. Uh, you know, for them to have created such an iconic character for Marvel, um, and to not really see any of the money or profit that goes along with that. And that, that's the entire industry at this time. You know, it's, these guys were all creating characters. They were creating looks of characters. They were driving the industry in a way that was making millions of dollars for the companies such as Marvel and DC. And they weren't really seeing any of the money from that on the back end. And they just kind of all came to the conclusion that they didn't want to spend their whole lives making millions of dollars for other people. And by all accounts, you know, Image Comics probably should have failed. Um, it still exists today. Uh, it's still thriving today. Uh, it's still a place where any creator can go and publish their work and own their work. Hands down. You know, Image doesn't own properties. They simply publish them. Uh, which has its negative consequences. It's a double-edged sword in a lot of instances. Um, and, you know, it, it's one of those things where they wanted it to work out in a certain way, and sadly it didn't. Uh, there was a continuity of an image-shared universe at one time, which really doesn't exist anymore, and that's sad because they had some really cool ideas, as we'll see in future episodes. But it's important that they were able to make a place where creators could thrive without outside interference and without having the worry of, you know, an editor breathing down their back, telling them what they could and couldn't publish. Uh, that's really the beauty of Image and what these guys created for future generations of creators, where they could come to this publisher, publish their work the way they wanted it published, the way they want it to look, tell the story they want to tell, and be able to do it on their own terms. And I really hope that that never goes away. I love that Image Comics still exists today. I love that it's a place that rewards hard work and creators being creative. And I really am happy that, you know, a group of people got together at one point and said enough is enough. We need to make a place where we can thrive, um, if for nothing else, just for ourselves and our ability to create the things that we want to create. Uh, here on page number 31, we see an advertisement for Malibu Comics, which sadly doesn't exist anymore. And uh, some people would argue that that's not necessarily a bad thing, but Malibu was another company where they were outside the box thinkers. And I really do kind of miss some of the stuff that they had going on, but you know, some of their works have lived on through image and we'll see that going forward one day as well. Here on page 32, we have another ad for Malibu comics, uh, the protectors. It's the next big thing in comics in 92, which is why none of us probably remember it. Uh, then we also have an ad for, uh, advanced comics, um, maximum collection and selection. That's kind of cool. And then at the end, we have, uh, two advertisements for where you can find comic book stores, comic news, their hotlines. This is cool. 1-900 number hotlines, something you're never going to see again in any capacity, even close to this. Uh, wow. 95 cents per minute. That is rough. I hope that news was worth it when you're paying a dollar a minute. And at the bottom, you can find out what's in store for only $2 a call. Wow, guys, what a bargain. Thanks. And that concludes our look at Spawn number one. Uh, if you like the video, please give me a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe. Feel free to comment below. I can't necessarily respond to everybody, but I'll do my best to see if I can respond to some of you. And uh, I hope to see you back here again on the next video. Have a great day.